Thank you all for um, coming. So what I'm going to do today is uh, broadly, I think, in about three parts. I'll say a little bit about the, um, a few comparative remarks about how to locate the notion of social epistemology in classical India, by which, an ancient India, by which I mean broadly the period from about the 7th or 8th century BC to the 10th century. And I'll make some comparative remarks about uh, how the trajectory of uh, this thought world developed uh, very broadly in comparison to uh, uh, the Chinese or the Western um, his historical experience of social epistemology. And then I will look at two different uh, areas uh, of social epistemology in this uh, ancient and classical Indian world. And then I will end by asking what kind of relevance looking at uh, the percolation of knowledge and the conditions under which it exists. Um, what happens when we compare or take a perspective from this uh, classical Indian tradition uh, at some of the challenges we face today um, in the conditions of a global modernity that has been particularly developed because of the Western European experience. So it, it is in some senses comparative in order to contextualize what I'm trying to say. So uh, if you're going to essay uh, a shorthand, you'd say about this Indian world that it was fundamentally and deeply pluralistic and deeply and um, without question hierarchical. So pluralism and hierarchy were absolutely the two uh, vectors by which ancient and classical Indian thought developed. And both of those have consequences because in a sense, looking at that, uh, that world in those terms helps us really see how different um, global modernity is and the kind of debates and uh, disagreement we face now might be seen somewhat differently if the experience of the world had been different in how modernity came about. The third thing also that might mark uh, ancient and classical India was a relatively recessive idea of the polity. That is to say, of the importance of military and economic power and the prerogative of violence being the preserve of a particularly fixed identity-giving territory. So the contrast there I'm thinking about is with China. So even though, in fact, through much of Chinese history, uh, right until up to the second or third uh, century BC and the formation of the Han Empire, and even subsequently, for example, in the time of the, uh, the Song Dynasty in the 9th, 10th century, and thereafter in the 15th, 16th century with the Manchu, even though we have, in fact, very fragmented imperial formations in the land that was known to the Han Chinese as the Middle Kingdom, you still have a narrative looking back all the way to Confucius, who himself lived in a very fragmented world, political world, all the way back you have the exaltation of an idea that um, discussion, debate, scholarship, the arts, all of that are Pos are possible, they can exist only in the condition of a stable state. So there is always the idea of a unifying force under which the stability in society holds, such that the intellectual and the artistic life can flourish. In India, on the other hand, although there have been empires which have risen and fallen, there have been um, texts going back perhaps to the second, third century in particular BC, which talk about the role of the king and how uh, a land is to be controlled. Nevertheless, 
a dominant idea locates the role of the king and the martial classes lower than that of the ritualists and the intellectuals. So kingdoms might come and go, and each such formation will of course strive for the same kind of grasp on power and stability that rulers all over the world seek. However, the thought world is not dependent on it. In fact, kingdoms are part of this larger thought world where the debates are really about the nature of reality, the nature of truth, the nature of human interaction, and so forth. So one of the things that we see with India, or what we now think of loosely as India, South Asia, as the subcontinent, is that only relatively rarely was there an idea of an imperial formation or any such state that could hold so much land together. Of course, we have had over periods of time Ashoka in the second century BCE, or the Gupta Empire in the fourth century, uh, or the Mughals, or indeed the British, and the modern Indian state, and the other uh, South Asian states, trying to consolidate land, but those were often exceptions. However, right from a very early period, perhaps by 1000 BCE, you already have the site geography of what is known as Bharata Varsha, the land of the Bharat, where um, bounded broadly by the Himalayas and sort of fading out into what is now Afghanistan, all the way, of course, down to the natural boundaries of the Arabian Sea and the uh, Bay of Bengal. This land was one in which ideas percolated, sometimes with astonishing speed. So that within a matter of a century, ideas that were being propounded in what is now Kashmir would be found in manuscript form in what is now Kerala, the very southern end of India. So there was a clear sense of people passing through uh, the boundaries of competing, often bitterly competing um, kingdoms, but the scholars passed through these places. So there's an idea that this pluralism is something like an episteme. It is not a dependent on the stability of a polity, of the political. Which goes to show how much the modern Indian state is more modern than it is uh, Indian in the, in the classical sense of the term, Bharat. The other contrast is with what happened with the trajectory of um, Western thought in the way in which the relatively localized um, thought world of ancient Greece was transformed in the latter part of the existence of the Roman Empire by Christianity into a world in which a single dominant political power and a single dominant um, ideal a spiritual ideal and a temporal ideal were aligned or sought to be aligned time and time again. So yes, you find a particular kind of fundamental uh, pluralism, although Socrates did pay a price for acting on it, in ancient Greece. But when we think back on what has become of Western thought, there is this constant idea of seeking a single knock-all-else-down ideal that is sought for, whether it was uh, the, uh, the nature of um, disruptions within Christianity that led through the Great Schism and uh, the Reformation, or whether it is, of course, the great challenge uh, of the uh, Enlightenment to Christianity, which, in a sense, replaced one type of um, monotonic universalism of idea and doctrine with another. Now what happens in India is that, that I'm using in this very historically loose way, is that all through those centuries, those millennia, there is the acceptance that 
there are fundamental doctrines about the nature of reality, teachings about what human life is about, which will coexist and compete with each other. As early as the 7th and 8th century, we are having this wide array of thinkers challenging every single idea about ritual, about cosmogony, about the nature of consciousness, about the nature of social responsibility. And of course, we have the great eruptions that have lasted for much longer, like the teachings of the Buddha, or to a lesser extent, the teachings of Mahavira, who founded uh, the religion now we, that we call Jainism. But even within the traditions that we now think of as Hindu, we have really fundamental disagreements. For example, there is a constant effort by a relatively small group of hegemonic upper class men, the Brahmins, to keep asserting that really the conditions of life are organized according to the revelations of the sacred texts that are called the Veda. The Vedas are a revelation of reality itself. But even there, is that a revelation by a god? Or is it, in fact, some kind of a verbal self-structuration of reality that was revealed to the uh, sages? There are fundamental disagreements. So you have an astonishing idea that the sacred text, does it require a god or does it not require a god, are found in the same so-called tradition. And then you have many other thinkers and uh, texts and communities which we now think of for a variety of reasons in the modern Indian state as Hindu, but who reject even the authority of the Veda, raising, of course, the interesting question that students of Hinduism are made to sit through uh, endless classes about over the years, which is, what is Hinduism? Now, why I'm saying this is to sort of drive home the point that when we talk about a social epistemology in this ancient and classical Indian world, we're having to deal, therefore, with a pluralism that is pluralistic all the way down. And yet, as I mentioned, there is this percolation of ideas. There is a, a confidence with which the texts are replicated, not always in the same language, but sometimes because of the power of Sanskrit, which is the high language of philosophical debate, the ideas percolate even more quickly because it's not even lost in translation, as it were. Now, what kind of a social epistemology would come, would, could arise in this kind of um, context? So I'm going to outline broadly two different kinds of social epistemologies. One I would call the, uh, the epistemology of debate, and the other, with a lot of qualifications, I'm going to call the epistemology of dissent. And I'm, uh, I'm aware there's a problem with having to map what dissent means in the Indian uh, context, as opposed to, say, what we might be familiar from uh, the history of early modern Britain. But I'll come back to that. Let's go back to the idea of uh, the social epistemology of debate. Now, what happens is that almost at the start of the common era, there is a kind of a codification of ideas that have been percolating over the last seven or eight centuries previously, and which are constantly um, returned to in the subsequent 1,000, 1,500 years, really, right up to the period of the early pre -modern, or the late pre-modern. This idea is that we must agree in order to know that we are even disagreeing in order, therefore, to debate, we must agree on the means by which we can establish knowledge. It's a Sanskrit word called pramana. It's a very, it means basically to measure. Now, in a formal way, this system is supposed somehow to bring one's cognition in accordance with the way one takes things to be, 
And I'm being very, very indirect here because the minute we start talking about things like it must correspond to reality, it must be internally coherent, it must be a, 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 a truth statement, we are immediately uh, devolving out into particular theories which often bitterly contest each other. But the Pramana, the idea is that somehow our cognition measures the world in which it finds itself. How does it do it? Again, there is broad, disagree uh, broad agreement. It says, well, clearly perception plays a role. Uh, systematic reasoning, inference plays a role. To some extent, of course, we're all reliant on testimony because we can't always either reason through or ourselves perceive the vast majority of things that are there and about which we talk and about which we make knowledge claims. And then there are two or three other means that some systems um, affirm. And again, I've got to be very careful because as soon as we start saying, well, perception, what do you mean by it? Ah, that's the problem because, I don't know, the, in the last census I did, and I don't think that things have changed in the last 25 years, uh, I think there were about 25 different theories of perception by the ninth century. So as soon as you start saying, what do you mean by perception? Of course, there are these broad ideas that the senses are involved. There is a relationship that is intentional between the senses and its objects. But as soon as we start then specifying, is it direct? Is it representational? Is it immediate? Is it mediated through concepts? We start having uh, this uh, sort of... Um, growth in the number of theories about it. And the same thing happens with what are the constituents of reasoning. So at a kind of metaphilosophical level, there is an agreement that we might disagree even about the most basic means of knowledge and what they mean, but we need them. So that's the first idea, that there is a common framework of terminology that we can then debate that are weighted in a quite sophisticated way that unless you know the texts, you can't simply walk in just any more than you can walk into uh, an advanced philosophy seminar in English and know what's going on. The words sound like the words you use in ordinary language, but they are already weighted because every person knows by the time, certainly in the 4th or 5th century, when these texts have started densifying in the cultural atmosphere of the Gupta Empire, every uh, thinker knows that there are others who, with whom he may or may not agree. But this metaphilosophical agreement means that there is a, an agreed terminology for people coming in from very different places and who, uh, whose mother tongues would have been uh, very different. They tend to, however, converse in Sanskrit, which by the second or third century BCE um, managed to live precisely by dying. It was a language that was no longer spoken in the ordinary world. But because its grammar was fixed because its roots, the root words were fixed, because the rules for generating words, new concepts out of that base was fixed. There was an enormous stability to this very elite activity of talking, uh, discussing uh, ideas in Sanskrit. So that's a metaphilosophical idea. But what is the real concrete consequence in terms of this deep pluralism I was talking about to so this idea that you have an agreement of this common terminology but then you disagree on how you uh, define these means? The crucial idea is whatever you mean by each of these means, when you utilize them, you utilize them in the context of who you are debating with and what you are debating. The very simple idea, an idea, of course, that 
um, took a long time and took, in fact, uh, the ruptures of modernity to get established in Europe after the Greeks. It is the idea that you can't debate with someone about something where you do not agree on the terms of that debate. So there is no point if you are speaking to somebody who is not a Buddhist to say, but the Buddha says this is the nature of consciousness, or that the self does not exist. There's no point the person will say, yes, I know, that's the problem. You depend on the Buddha. End of the story. However, when you are arguing with a non-Buddhist about the nature of the self, if you do say, let's look at memory. You and I agree on memory as something that human consciousness carries? Yes, OK. How do we explain it? And a person who might say, assert some kind of a theory of a self that is diachronically, that is across time, unitary, would say, you can't have memories unless there is a consciousness which has the same uh, content from the time of the experience to the time of remembering. And the Buddhist will say, no, I agree with you that memory is to be defined as the capacity to recall what happened in a past time. But I will explain to you how, in fact, memory can be conveyed without relying on the self. And this is important for me as a Buddhist because, in fact, the Buddha said that there is no self, but I'm not going to bring it to the table. So what happens is you constantly shift back and forth on the kind of arguments you have. Now, sometimes you might say, well, Everybody agrees that perception is a non-negotiable form of gaining knowledge. However you define knowledge, you are not going to be able to say that the senses don't deliver anything. OK, so both of us are agreed. And it might look on the surface that if I turn around and tell you, uh, well, nobody has actually ever seen anybody going to heaven. That's the end of the story, isn't it? Well, yes and no. If we are going to be talking to somebody who has a particular definition of perception as what is only ever given to some kind of um, a normal person with a normal range, and you are able to then defend what that, define what that normality means, then I'm going to have to argue with you to say, well, actually, perception should be applied to means of relating to the world that are not limited to just the five senses, what you might think of as, say, extrasensory. It might be something that is um, cultivated, just as people might not look, say, and spot the eye of the deer and the undergrowth, as well as the hunter who has cultivated that kind of keen vision, why not? There, why, why can we not postulate that there might be people who have cultivated a particular capacity to see things beyond the veil of our ordinary senses? Just an example. So what you have to do is you're simultaneously having to argue, because we've all agreed that perception is a means of knowledge. And each side will have to define what perception is. And both sides might agree that perception is the place at which they pitch their, their battle. But nevertheless, you might then find the definitions themselves becoming arguments in aid of commitments that your opponent does not share. So you have these multiple levels going on. You have this meta-level commitment, a common terminology. You have an agreement that everybody utilizing these means of knowledge must have proper definitions of it. You agree that if there is an agreement over that definition, then we can move on to something we disagree on based on that. But if we disagree on the definition itself, then we'll have to establish that first before we can get on to the other claims we disagree with each other about. So when you have this very complex 
although very elitist system, pluralism is not only just possible, it becomes absolutely um, the very lifeblood of culture. At no point does it seem that there is a need for what we might say doxastic control, a control of the beliefs of people. You do not have any kind of temporal institution which codes a particular doctrinal commitment to some ultimate truth to which you have everybody else um, agreeing to. You expect that even if you are a brilliant thinker in a great and powerful emperor's court with all the resources and uh, to not only yourself travel the land but have a retinue of students, you would not expect to get more than the people you debate with to change their mind. That's what you hope, but they might not. So at no point do we see in this kind of sort of thousand 500 to 2,000 years, a conceptualization of a land under one rule with a set of doctrinal commitments to which all must adhere or at least all must argue for in some version or the other when they disagree. Rather, you have this idea that you are never going to find the absence of disagreement. So much so that by the seventh century, this very orthodox philosopher who defends an atheistic interpretation of the Vedas says, it is well known that when two philosophers meet, there are three opinions. And it is very funny because I remember about 25, 28 years ago when I was in Singapore, I'm fairly sure without knowing this, the sort of legendary authoritarian ruler of Singapore, um, uh, Lee, uh, I forget his name now, um, he said more or less the same thing. That's the problems with Indians, you know, he said. When you get two Indians, you get three views and you get four trade unions. And of course, he was saying that as very much uh, a um, Lee Kuan Yew, sorry. Um, he was very much criticizing this idea. And I thought, no, 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 this is, this is the good thing. Of all the things that are messy about India, this is a good thing. But this is a deep historical uh, truth. How does it work, though? What's the price that is paid? Because every episteme carries with it a price. The price was hierarchy, and an elitism of discussion. So even if you get, for example, the Buddhists and the Jains, most of whom are uh, the philosophers are monks, uh, they reject the structuration of uh, society into caste or into the different kinds of classes, fixed biologically uh, determined classes. But then it turns out very often they are Brahmins who became Buddhists because they know the uh, their, their opponents' views. So first of all, of course, knowledge of Sanskrit, which is highly, uh, as I said, it's frozen, it's highly theoretical, it requires an enormous amount of uh, training, and it is restricted. So th the fluency with which ideas circulate, the clarity with which opponents' views are understood and debated, the intelligence with which the debates pick on those things that people disagree on, but within the framework of what they already agree on. As I give said in my examples, whether it's testimony or whether it's inference, or indeed perception. All of that is possible only because there is, in a way that almost sort of uncannily uh, anticipates the views of Mill, uh, a real elitism about who has the intellectual qualifications. Now, the interesting thing about this kind of intellectual qualification is 
oddly, it doesn't turn on the question of whether people are intelligent enough or not. But the most astonishing things about the classical Indian texts is you never have, uh, from, from the perspectives of the long history of the West, you never have uh, a woman scholar, the rare woman scholar who enters into the debate, ever being told women can't argue because you've got smaller brains or you're less intelligent. In fact, when they win the arguments, they are seen as people of great epistemic and spiritual authority. But that did not at all mean that uh, gender hierarchies did not operate then in India as they do now. And the same thing happens with, with, with caste. If somebody from a caste who's, who's not allowed to learn, this, learn Sanskrit learns it, then he will be punished. Already granting that he has perfectly the ability to learn. It's not that he is a savage. It's not that he lacks the intellectual qualities. Rather, there is an innate hierarchy in which where you are born determines your um, functions in life as effectively as the features of the sun determine its functions or the features of water determine its functions. So the, there is no recourse, for good or bad as it were, to arguing for why people are incapable. The idea is, oh, it's not a question of whether they're capable or not, it's whether they ought to or not, and they ought not to simply depending on where they are born. Because where you're born determines what you do. That is the steep price of inequality that this extraordinarily pluralistic episteme of debate paid. That is to say, somebody else picked up the tab while the philosophers uh, did their philosophizing. Nothing has changed. It's just that it's a very different way in which it happened than how, for example, philosophy was conducted either in um, the uh, Athenian Republic or in uh, 18th century Germany, or indeed today in Britain or elsewhere. One consequence of this elitism to the pluralistic uh, episteme of debate was this idea of um, what, I, what I'm calling the episteme of dissent. Now, already you, you would be expecting that it cannot obviously be dissent in the way in which there were dissenters to Rome, or, or indeed the way the Puritans were dissenters and so forth, because obviously the dissent is not from the monotonic doctrinal commitments that control the thought world or are, are hegemonic in a thought world, as, as was the experience in, um, in, in Europe. You could have any idea you want, but where would you discuss it? How would you express it? Now, the way this dissent played out in India was basically a subversion of hierarchy as the hegemonic upper class males would have it. The way you basically do it, if you don't have access, is you use other languages. You create your own circles of intellectual and artistic activity. You develop whole new um, vocabularies to express um, new ideas. Sooner or later, the best and most interesting ideas will somehow be assimilated by the Sanskrit world has happened in the thousand years of the first millennium when these very interesting ideas about popular uh, religious um, practices, what we now think of as Hinduism, but, but simply did not exist before the start of the common era. These ideas were often highly subversive. They challenged the Brahminical hierarchies, but they generated in many languages which are not Sanskritic, which are not in Sanskrit, they de develop very interesting theological ideas about the relationship between humanity and divinity, about the nature of emotion, the nature of the expression of love, both with, to God and between humans. But what you see is by the 9th, 10th, 12th centuries, they're already being theorized in Sanskrit. So there's always that uh, percolation where, of course, the hegemonic uh, episteme of debate tries to find ways 
of legitimating in its own eyes these means of speaking. But even as it does it, further new ideas keep proliferating. Th this notion of dissent, in a way, exists only because these hierarchies are relatively unshifting. They're given by birth. But it does mean that there are spaces in which these ideas uh, form. Sometimes they are intermediate spaces. So the languages after Sanskrit was, as it were, frozen into its classical form, obviously people continued speaking, and you have what are known as Prakrits. So these are the actual living vulgar languages. The Buddha himself spoke in one version of it called Pali. Although, of course, Pali then became uh, the formal language of that strain of Buddhism. But these, in these many Prakrits, there were people who did know how to learn and, and, and read and write. They often came from intermediate or lower status groups. Farmers, marginal uh, traders, people who were not, as it were, part of that kind of tradition of debate. And we have quite a large collection of poems, especially, sometimes written form, but very often oral, very often performative from some of the most marginal groups, which continue to thrive to this day and express ideas about precisely such things as knowledge, sacred text, God, ritual, that the elite try to keep within their circle of debate. They express ideas, but in radically different vocabularies. Now, because of this lack of centralization of this, this classical Indian world when it came to either political or uh, religious power, there could be modes of control. You could have punishment for people who were found uh, wandering into the temple where the higher caste people were debating. But the temple at the, uh, the, on the margin of the village flourishes. There are places in the, by the seaside where the fishermen compose their own versions of what they think God and God's love means. There are people who are herders up in the Himalayas who talk about the nature of love in often dramatically different ways to the court poets, a lot of which we now beginning to see survives in far greater form than in the 18th or 19th century when the colonial scholars sat with the Brahmins and tried to develop a certain kind of canon. The canon doesn't work as we see that knowledge living and thriving. So what we have therefore is once the price has been paid, whether you, are, whether you want to pay it or not, you pay it, of hierarchical inequalities. Pluralism, both within this social epistemology of debate and in the social epistemology of dissent, thrives. Now, what this helps us think about is what is happening in the modern world. Basically, for me, if I'm to, to put it in a very simple way, the problems of the modern state of India come from the laudable and remarkable achievement of the mothers and fathers of the Indian constitution to place a liberal idea of equality at the heart of uh, India's legal existence. And then they couldn't quite figure out how the pluralism of India, which it's, as I was outlining now, depended on inequality. How that was, how are you going to square that circle? How are you going to uh, pluralize liberalism? And my suggestion would be that the uh, violent contestations in contemporary India come from the internalization of the idea that you do need, you do have a monotonic state with a single um, commitment to a set of values somehow having to coexist with this proliferation, the continuing proliferation of uh, dissent. So the episteme of debate has been brought under unbearable pressure. So the idea that 
You can disagree with somebody only on what, on the grounds that you agree on, has disappeared in India. What kind of a bearing does it have on the West? And the reason, of course, it happened in India was because of the way modernity came to India through the colonial experience and the very serious way in which the founders of modern India agreed that even with independence, what must remain is this high liberal idea of equality. What has happened in the West, of course, is that I haven't had obviously time to give you the genealogy of it, but the claim I'm making basically is that whether it was through Christianity or whether it was through Enlightenment ideas and definitely through the birth and sustenance of the very idea of the nation state, it has, it has always been the case that the final achievement of debate was to establish the one right view. Now, that kind of monotonicity had, has really been extraordinarily effective in terrible ways with global empires, but also in the very birth and flourishing of liberal equality. It is only when there is an agreement that there is one principle that must hold, regardless of your status in life, the place you come from, the kind of qualifications you have, it all doesn't matter that there is a point at which humanity is equal. That was really possible only through the terrible legacy of the imperial nation state out of which liberalism was born. But what we find in this world, the, 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 the world of liberalism, is a, a remarkable and unprecedented explosion of pluralization. The Western countries which invented the idea of the liberal individual and that equality are finding people now, whether born and brought up here or racially from whichever part of the world, wherever they might be, however we might want to exclude or include them, are part of a global debate in which they basically say, I don't buy into your starting point. And the liberal social epistemology has proved woefully incapable of dealing with this kind of pluralism. What do you do? What we need, of course, is the process of patiently working through determining what it is we agree on in order to be able to disagree. Since that historically takes time, and I'm suggesting it happened only because of a particular kind of elite commitment to inequality, how do we square the circle? Or how do we circle the square? It's the other way around. What we do find now, therefore, is the ease with which debate simply flies out of control into the uh, violent disagreements that we find today, especially on the internet. So my point is the outcome of people getting hurt because they are othered. That debate becomes shouting happens in India for almost the opposite historical etiology than it happens in the West. But, of course, the result is the attempt in the world now to say, how do we deal with a deeply plural world while committing ourselves to fundamental tenets of equality, which are radically unprecedented in the history of the world? Of course, there were also forms of equality that the Buddha taught. And, of course, we find forms of equality in Islam. And so there are other stories to be told too. So, but what I'm suggesting is that at heart, the question of social epistemology is one of this debate between how do you hold pluralism and certain kinds of common commitments together? But at least understanding the different uh, ways, the etiologies by which we might arrive at this problem, looking at uh, being sensitive to the radically different ways in which we have arrived at the same uh, common shared global modernity might perhaps help us not think 
that one particular line which probably started in Greece and mysteriously moved to 18th century Oxford and Cambridge and then come to rule the world and had to then fight with the Germans to get the right to say it is the only way in which we could be faced with the challenges of the social epistemology of pluralism. Thank you.